So, uh, thank you. So, my name is Claire Turnbull, um, and I'm a researcher at the ICR, but I am also a consultant in clinical genetics and an honorary consultant in public health, and it's with this combination of perspectives um, that Pippa and Mark asked if I might give a few thoughts about policy and regulatory priorities. Uh, so those are my financial disclosures. And so in this area, I think there's a number of things that one could focus on. I think probably we're now in 2023 relatively happy around thinking about how to evaluate technical performance, the calling of the GCs, A's and T's on genotyping and sequencing. So I'm going to say that's relatively straightforward. Um, the next focus might be using genomics in the diagnostic context. So that's what we do at the moment. Patients who have walked through the front door of the hospital with symptoms of a rare disease. And again, I think this is well addressed through the structures that Sue presented. We have our test directory. We need to keep auditing it. We need to check on detection rates. We need to check on clinical actionability. But again, a relatively more straightforward area. But it does uh, seem a good point to pause and just reflect for a moment about some of the lessons we have learnt in using genomic tests to make diagnoses in patients who have presented to us with features of rare disease. So um, as a clinical geneticist, uh, I speak for my clan, we have, uh, over the last 40 years, begun to recognise that our estimates of risk and phenotypic penetrance are highly upwardly biased, and that's because we have measured and looked at patients who walk through the front door of the hospital with features of disease. Secondly, we've come to recognise that actually even with individuals in the same family with the same pathogenic variant, there is a huge variability in the burden of modifier factors, both genetic and non-genetic, which results in very marked variable expressivity of phenotype. Thirdly, <clears throat> we, we stare at our shoes and we pretend in our practice, because we don't have enough data to do otherwise, we pretend that Mother Nature has issued a standardised set of risks for all pathogenic variants in a given gene, whilst we actually know there are quite varying variant-specific risks for these different pathogenic variants. And that's, of course, the missense variants and the different domains, but even actually the protein truncating variants, which our mother told us all underwent nonsense-mediated decay, they also have different risks too. And fourthly, uh, people working a bit displaced from clinical diagnostic genomics might think in the lab that there's a big manual, and when the clinical scientists find a new variant, they just look up in the manual of variant classifications, whether it's pathogenic or benign. Whereas, in fact, variant interpretation is a very subjective, human undertaking. It involves getting bits of evidence from different places, unearthing it from old journals, and often looking at the patient and getting some good details about the, pa the phenotype in the patient in front of you, integrating all of this evidence and coming to a dichotomous conclusion as to whether that variant is pathogenic or benign. And therefore, although in clinical genetics we've really embraced how these amazing new technologies have enabled us to find new pathogenic variants contributory to the phenotype of the patient in front of us, I think because of what I'm going to call the four horsemen of genotype phenotype prediction, we have become much, much more cautious in prognosticating to our patients and their families what the future might hold. Uh, with which notion I segue seamlessly on to the next theme, which is using genomic tests for prediction of disease in the general population, which, as we've heard today from various speakers, is, is just beginning to happen. It's imminently on the horizon. So population genomic screening. And I think we're probably relatively in agreement that this really is the area we need to focus on and think about in terms of policy and regulatory review. However, we do have a manual here. We have the criteria for population screening, written in 1968 by Wilson and Junkner of the World Health Organization. 
which is a set of criteria which have stood as the Ten Commandments of Public Health worldwide for the last 50 years. And actually, these have required relatively little updating by the UK National Screening Committee, which was last undertaken last year to include criteria covering genomic tests. So these are extremely helpful as a disease-centric framework to think about population screening. You need to think about the epidemiology and natural history of the disease. You need to understand that. You need to understand latency. You need to know about the proposed intervention with which you're planning to treat the disease when you identify it pre-symptomatically. You need to know that your intervention is going to improve outcome compared to waiting for the disease to present symptomatically. Otherwise, you don't go looking for that disease. You need to think about the screening test you're proposing to use and the characteristics of that screening test, uh, its performance, but also you need to know its distribution in the population that you're planning to use it in. If the, if the paradigm meets all of these criteria, there are then additional criteria around how to approach evaluation and implementation. So let's carry this with us and uh, look at a couple of the paradigms that have been touched on today and think of these in terms of wilson Jungner. So thinking first about uh, newborn whole exome or whole genome. So this is flipping wilson Jungner on its head and rather than taking a disease-centric approach, saying what happens if we take a technology-centric approach and apply it for as many diseases as we can. And there are actually some reasonable data out there giving us a snapshot of how this might look. So um, they took uh, data from California, from 4.5 million newborn blood spot spots, um, for which they had follow-up data. So they looked retrospectively and compared uh, for 48 inborn errors of metabolism, the sensitivity and specificity for using tandem mass spec, which is a protein test, compared to whole exome. Um, I think this is very informative. You can see that the sensitivity is overall poorer, but they did pick up a tale of later presentations that were missed by the tandem mass spec. In terms of specificity, we get back to my four horsemen, that specificity is an issue here, not just in terms of the absolute numbers. You can see it's a bit poorer, about 1.6% false positive rate. And if you scale that up to the, the annual number of newborns, that's quite a lot of false positives. But I think it's uh, really important to think about uh, the nature of the specificity because in most screening tests, a screening mammogram, a, a cervical smear, a tandem mass spec protein test, the, the premise is you have a superior diagnostic test with which you can refute the findings of your screening test. A genetic test is a prediction of the future, and therefore there isn't a superior test with which you can refute these findings. So your, your, test, your screen positives become SPIDs, they are screen positive disease indeterminate. And then you have this interesting challenge of, of how you follow these guys up. So what tests and tools do you follow them up with? How often do you follow them up with? And for how long? And ultimately, you've got this tension because in this group, a small minority are going to be that tale of late presentations. And those guys you have to catch pre-symptomatically because that was the whole purpose of the endeavor and balancing that against the much larger majority who will turn out to have been perfectly healthy newborns and you're in danger of medicalizing them and their families and their period of infancy. So I think we've got some interesting issues here in our wilson Jungner framework around the characteristics of the test and how it performs in this context. But also, we may have taken a technology-first approach, but we do need to think back about the diseases and knowing the natural history of these rare diseases. And I think the one where a lot of these very rare diseases um, falls down and these new biologic treatments is we don't have any evidence for these new, new and very expensive treatments that their impact on disease is improved from starting them pre-symptomatically compared to waiting for the patient to present symptomatically. So thinking about the, the other use case we've heard about this afternoon, so um, complex diseases of adulthood, so using polygenic scores. So uh, just a few thoughts here. Complex diseases, the clue is in the name. These are complex. Most of these diseases, much of the etiology is from the accrued exposure to environmental influences, 
mediated through somatic mutation and various other processes of aging that we poorly understand. Uh, using twin studies and other genetic epidemiologic you, um, uh, approaches, you can quantify the heritability, so that's the totality of the genetic component. So for breast cancer, that's 31%. Myocard <coughs> male my myocardial infarction, that's fatal, 37 Colorectal cancer, that's 15%, but that's all of the genetic component. So in breast cancer, which is very well studied, we know that 40% of the genetic component lies in common variants tractable by um, the uh, um, uh, SNP array. So that's 40% of 31%, so that's 13% overall. And of those, we found just under half. So our polygenic risk score for breast cancer is informing us on 7% of the etiological factors underlying disease. Secondly, thinking in terms of the test, largely what we're now looking at is a kind of two-step paradigm. So we've got our polygenic risk score, by which we're stratifying the risk of ever getting disease, and then juxtaposing that with some manner of screening test, which we're going to perform periodically in a subset, which is going to tell us whether that patient has pre-symptomatic disease today. So you're then sort of compounding two suboptimal tests, We've got our limited predictiveness of our polygenic risk score, which ultimately means that if we take a high-risk quantile, they're only going to be at modestly elevated risk compared to the population risk, whilst the majority of disease is going to reside in the low-risk group. We also, as we heard earlier, we've got this issue with differential performance with different ancestries and so forth. We then... What our polygenic risk score is doing is um, defining a quantile which is modestly enriched for disease incidence. It's not changing anything about the type of disease you will find in those individuals. So whatever shortcomings your disease screening tool had, they, it still has, even though you're applying it to a slightly enriched group. So if you have poor sensitivity for specificity, which is ultimately one of the big issues with PSA screening for prostate cancer, that doesn't change. If you have a screening paradigm which massively over-detects indolent disease, PSA for prostate cancer, you still have that problem, even if you look in an enriched group. And then there are various other screening tools which have a, um, you know, unfortunately have a very minimal impact on survival. So we all thought CA125 for ovarian cancer, you know, there's lots and lots of approaches to screening. You do the trial and, and actually you can't stage shift, you don't impact on survival. So thinking here, again, we have, to, we have to really think about those two screening tests as, as a combined package. And of course, um, as we heard earlier from Gil, there's, there's a lot of unknowns in terms of the public reaction to polygenic scores, because of course nearly all of our data on polygenic scores comes from mathematical modelling retrospectively of epidemiological data sets. There's a minimum of data from actually applying these scores in real humans. We know very little about uptake, particularly in the real population. As we've heard, of course, people who volunteer for studies of polygenic scores and screening are not representative. So the uptake in the population as a whole, and probably talking about um, exacerbating health inequalities, it's likely that pop the that the health inequality will be exacerbated because those are going to be the people who are least likely to want to have a genetic test. <coughs> Excuse me. We've also um, uh, touched a little on unintended behavioural implications. So will people who are defined as being high risk, <coughs> excuse me, will they become anxious? Will they engage in sort of uh, accelerated health-seeking behaviours while your low-risk individuals uh, will perceive themselves to be at reduced risk of disease, they'll neglect symptoms with which they present and potentially disregard uh, basic preventative health prevention measures like um, lifestyle and diet. And then this big unknown that we already have screening programs, if you start trying to take screening away from the low risk quantiles, which is where your big health, econo health economic benefit would be, is that going to be acceptable because you're still going to have a sizable proportion of your disease arising in those assigned as low risk. So again, I think in terms of um, uh, common complex disease and polygenic scores, there's some really big unknowns down here in, in this area. So just pulling this together and uh, thinking uh, 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 sort of more, more broadly, 
I think if we <clears throat> are thinking about using polygenic scores in the predictive context, I think we have to be mindful that um, in comparison to sort of typical models of population screening, in which we have a very cautious approach, that population genomic screening has two big red flags. Firstly, is there's very limited predictiveness or limitations to predictiveness, which in the context of rare pathogenic variants in rare disease is around those four horsemen. That's uncertainty. And in the context of common variants and common disease, the limited predictiveness results in quite modest enrichment. And then secondly, the fact that this isn't a snapshot test for disease today that you can refute. This is a long-term, lifelong prediction with long-term, lifelong implications, uh, which potentially reflect in significant cost and resource of having to follow up or monitor those individuals, but also psychological and behavioural sequelae that we uh, understand very little at the moment. So I think we, more than other paradigms of screening, we need to stand on the shoulders of Wilson and Jugner and learn from what they said. We need to have this very disease-centric, uh, detailed evaluation going through all of those criteria. Only if it is a suitable paradigm by those criteria do we start applying that screening in humans. We need, because uh, these are new models of screening, we need consented volunteers. Because these consented volunteers are completely unrepresentative of the population as a whole, you cannot compare data on them to population data or historic data. You have to randomise. But because these consented volunteers are totally unrepresentative, you cannot generalise. So if you see a signal of efficacy in those types of studies, you then need to go on and do cluster randomised studies in the population of the type that the National Screening Committee do when they have a new test they want to bring into newborn screening or in the age extension trials. And that's how you see what happens when you offer this type of screening at population level. And after that, even if you have effectiveness in your cluster level RCT, you need to do very detailed economic evaluation informed by your trial metrics. And I think it's only with that type of systematic approach can we be happy that it is appropriate to implement these types of screening within our NHS um, and that they will do more good than harm. So um, there's a lot of voices in this area. We know patient groups, they want to see progress for their disease. We know government want to see progress in early detection. There's clearly massive interest from the diagnostic sector and from pharma. But I hope some of the cautions that I have articulated uh, might be well reflected uh, in a couple of quotes I will share. Uh, firstly, the iconic quote from Muir Gray, um, all screening programmes do harm, some do good as well, and of these, some do more good than harm at reasonable cost. And a lesser known but equally applicable quote uh, from a dear uh, former colleague of ours in clinical genetics, uh, Professor Maria Bittner, uh, I overheard her mutter on receipt of a questionable referral letter, genomics is not an amateur sport. So thank you for listening. Thank you.